people have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect. Hello viewers, I'm your host Uzma Jafri with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. Thanks to the consistent efforts of both New Delhi and Dhaka, the Indo-Bangladesh relations have reached new heights, with ties now getting stronger in different domains of defense, economy and culture. Recently, Foreign Ministers of India and Bangladesh, S. Jay Shankar and Abul Kalam Abdul Momin met in Indian capital New Delhi to provide additional impetus to thriving relations. In line with India's strengthening ties with neighboring Bangladesh, Foreign Minister S. J. Shankar hosted his Bangladeshi counterpart Abul Kalam Abdul Momin in New Delhi for the 7th Joint Consultative Commission. Both the ministers signed and exchanged agreements for furthering their ties during the meeting, which was the first physical JCC event since the advent of the coronavirus pandemic. Underscoring the partnership that has become robust over time, Jay Shankar applauded the joint efforts of both the countries during the COVID pandemic that saved several lives. India was the first country Bangladesh looked onto as soon as the vaccine manufacturing started in different countries and it found itself with none. The gamut of ties has expanded between the two over several years of formal relationship and both New Delhi and Dhaka have decided to take their partnership into the fresh domains of several fields including the cyber security and the upgradation of the railway system. We have also jointly overcome the pandemic uh, and uh, whether it was vaccine cooperation, whether it was the oxygen express, whether it was medical oxygen plants, supplies of medicines and life-saving drugs that we gave to each other, our shared fight uh, against COVID-19 has been exemplary. We now look forward to working with you to take our ties into new domains, uh, artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, startups, fintech. We were very pleased to receive your ICT minister. Uh, we had a very good visit by your railway minister recently and we would like to expand our cooperation on upgradation of the railway system. India and Bangladesh are actively involved in cooperation projects to boost bilateral relations and people-to-people -people connections between the two sides. Both the countries expressed satisfaction that despite challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic, they worked closer than ever before in every sector, from security and border management to mutually beneficial trade and investment flows. The two sides also discussed ways to increase train services and flights to facilitate the large number of Bangladeshi travellers who come to India for both tourism and medical treatment. After a long gap of more than two years due to the COVID-19 pandemic, passenger train services between India and Bangladesh resumed on May 29 this year. The previous JCC meeting, which was held in September 2020, saw the two dignitaries discussing ways to establish peace within shared borders. The year 2021 marked the golden jubilee of the bilateral dealings between Bangladesh and India. Uh, India is the most important and the closest neighbour of Bangladesh. And I am proud to say that because of the initiatives that you have taken, the Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi has taken, and also our Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, we achieved a lot of stability and peace within this region, and that is helping us to have development. A role model for bilateral and regional cooperation. The ministers appreciated that the trust and mutual respect shared between the two countries have only strengthened in the last decade. 
Over the last decades, India-Bangladesh relations have warmed up, entering a new era of cooperation, moving beyond historical and cultural ties to become more assimilated in the areas of trade, connectivity and defence. Observers say the JCC meeting helped prepare the grounds for Bangladesh Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina's planned visit to India, which is expected in July this year. Moving on, the situation for minorities is getting grimmer by the day in war-torn Afghanistan. In line with continual targeted attacks, another Sikh Gurdwara was attacked by terrorists belonging to Islamic State of Khorasan. International community and observers called out the Taliban government, which has maintained since its takeover of the country last year, that Afghanistan is safe and secure under their rule. The minority Sikh community in Afghanistan continues to remain a soft target for terrorist attacks. Recently, several terrorists associated with the Islamic State of Khorasan attacked Gurdwara Sahab Kartaparwan in capital Kabul. At least two people were killed in what is the latest in a line of targeted attacks on minorities in Islamic Afghanistan. An explosive-laden vehicle detonated just a few meters away from the temple gates. Had it passed the barrier, the damage and casualties would have been exponentially greater. Recounting the horrific details, an eyewitness said he saw intense fighting between the two sides that continued outside and inside the Gurdwara. The United Nations Assistance Mission in Afghanistan has called for the protection of all minorities in Afghanistan, including Sikhs, Hazaras, and Sufis. The Taliban, which rose to power in August of 2021, claimed to have secured the country. But repeated terrorist attacks not only contradict those claims, but also give weight to the international community's concerns of a potential risk of militancy resurgence. In addition to receiving widespread international criticism, the Taliban was also asked by several countries, including India, home to the Sikhs, to assertively act towards the protection of minorities. Observers believe that such attacks could set off a new wave of terrorism in the country, with smaller groups receiving tacit support from insiders. And this, they believe, has been the primary reason behind the US and the West not involving themselves in rebuilding the war-torn country. Also, the United States has not released Afghan funds frozen by it earlier this year, fearing its use by the Taliban to fund terror activities. Despite the recent attacks, some of which claimed by the Islamic State militant group, the Taliban, however, say that they can still fight all forms of attacks on its sovereignty and its people. The international community does not think so. Taliban is not in a position to provide security to minorities, number one. Number two, I would say that this hatred for non-Muslims exists and ability of these groups to carry out or kill non-Muslims with impunity exists. Prior to the Taliban's takeover last year, Hindus and Sikhs in Afghanistan numbered only approximately 600. Reports indicate that that number has dramatically decreased. Those remaining have been the subject of targeted attacks, predominantly by Sunni radical groups. The targeted attacks have driven Sikhs and Hindus out of the country, especially those with the economic and social resources to relocate. The situation continues to get grimmer by the day. And with no light appearing at the end of the tunnel, one can only hope against hope that things change one day 
and humanity prevails. Moving on. Sri Lanka is battling its worst financial crisis since independence in 1948 as decades of economic mismanagement and recent policy errors coupled with a hit from COVID-19 to tourism and remittances, drying up foreign reserves to record lows. And after several groups, it was the college students who took to the streets this week in capital Colombo as they demanded the resignation of the government of President Gotabaya Rajapaksa. Hundreds of university students, trade unionists and artists marched through the streets of Sri Lanka's capital, Colombo, demanding the resignation of the government of President Gotabaya Rajapaksa. Many protesters accuse Rajapaksa and his influential family of mishandling the economy. The worsening situation of Sri Lanka has led people angered by long queues, often overnight, for fuel faced off with security forces over the weekend. The ongoing economic situation of Sri Lanka has been exhausting drivers who have been waiting for hours for petrol. Sri Lanka is scrambling to find foreign exchange to pay for desperately needed fuel imports and its existing stock of petrol and diesel is projected to run out in a matter of days. The island nation also ordered public sector employees to work from home for two weeks due to the fuel shortage. An international monetary fund team began bailout talks in Sri Lanka on Monday as the country's cabinet cleared a constitutional amendment to dilute presidential powers that could assuage protesters amid rising tensions. A nine-member IMF team, which arrived in the commercial capital Colombo recently, held talks with Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe on how to structure what will be Sri Lanka's 17th loan program with the global lender. The United Nations has outlined a plan to raise $47 million to provide assistance to 1.7 million Sri Lankans worst hit by the crisis over the next four months. Time now for Asia This Week, the stories from across the continent. Villagers struggle to cope with destruction and losses in northeast Afghanistan after a massive earthquake killed at least 1,000 people. The magnitude 6.1 earthquake struck early on Wednesday on 22nd June about 160 kilometers southeast of Kabul in arid mountains dotted with small settlements near the border with Pakistan. While thousands of families have been affected by the quake, there are hundreds of others whose entire families have been wiped out. Paktita province remains one of the worst affected areas. Poor communications and a lack of proper roads are hampering relief efforts in a country already grappling with a humanitarian crisis which has deteriorated since the Taliban took over last August. According to US government data, the toll makes it Afghanistan's deadliest earthquake in two decades.
As per sources, Myanmar's military rulers have without explanation ordered all legal proceedings against deposed leader Aung San Suu Kyi to be moved from a courtroom to a prison. Nobel laureate Suu Kyi, who turned 77 on June 19, has been charged with at least 20 criminal offences since she was toppled in a coup early last year, including multiple counts of corruption. Hunta leader Min Aung Laing has so far allowed Suu Kyi to remain in detention at an undisclosed location in the capital Napido, despite convictions for incitement and several minor offences. Suu Kyi denies all charges. Suu Kyi's marathon court proceedings take place behind closed doors with only limited information reported by state media. A gag order has been imposed on her lawyers whose only access to her is on trial days. It is not clear how much Suu Kyi knows of the crisis in her country, which has been in chaos since the coup, with the military struggling to consolidate power and facing increasing resistance from militia groups. Electronic substrate for electric product is required to be shaped, miniature and applicable to multiple uses. Japanese electronic parts companies have the technology to make various electronic substrates. Jet dispenser is a type of substrate. トフができるジェットディスペンサーというものを我々が装備しております。で、それを前自動装置に通ヘッドにつけてですね、高速に通る処理をするという装置であります。精密なビデオナー技術といったところが非常に難しい技術になります。これはやはり日本のお家芸として
Adding the bright colors to the landscapes of Odisha, this festival commemorates the fertility of Mother Earth and womanhood. Let's have a look. Young girls and women decked up in their best of dresses and riding on swings while singing and dancing were the major scenes in Orissa during Rajo festival that was celebrated recently with huge pomp and show. This three-day long festival is the most important carnival in the state that celebrates menstruation and womanhood. It is believed that Mother Goddess Earth menstruates for those three days and hence she is given a ceremonial bath on the fourth day. As a mark of respect towards the earth during her menstruation days, all agricultural activities like ploughing, sowing is suspended for the three days as Mother Earth is expected to be going through rejuvenation. हमारा साधारण ओडिशा का एक मुख्य पर्व है जिसमें भगवान जी का पूजा तो नहीं होता है लेकिन ये मैंने खास करके ये लड़कियों के लिए मनाते हैं और ये हमारा जैसे कि बोलते हैं कि हमारा ओडिशा में तीन दिन के लिए ये पृथ्वी माता रजस्वाला होता है जैसे कि हमारा क्या बोलते हैं इसको मासिक धर्म बोलते हैं तो वैसे ही मैंने पृथ्वी माता का रज रज वाला को बोलते हैं कि वो रज बन मैंने रज मनाते हैं Celebrating the spirit of womanhood, this festival is of utmost importance to women who pamper themselves by wearing new dresses, applying alta, and dressing up with fashionable accessories. During the three days, women are given a break from all household work and they spend the entire day having fun on rope swings, playing indoor and outdoor games, singing folk songs and eating scrumptious food. रोजों में हम नए कपड़े पहनते हैं हमारे घर में पकवान बनता है फिर हम पीठा खाते हैं और हम झूला झूलते हैं लड़कियां तो सज, बहुत सज सवरते हैं और पाव में अल्ता लगाते हैं कुमकुम लगाते हैं माथे पे और डोली जो ये सब डोली है ना इसमें बहुत मैंने झूलते हैं और औरत सब सज के सवर के वो ताश लूडो खेलते हैं और ये क्या बनाते हैं और पोड़ा पिठा खाते हैं चकुली पिठा खाते हैं यह हमारा ओडिशा का एक मुख्य पर्व है Each day of the festival has its own name and significance. The first day is called Pahili Rajo. Second day is Rajo Sankranti or Mithun Sankranti and the third day is called Basi Rajo. During this festive occasion, various local delicacies, especially pitas like poda, chakuli, arisa, kakera, chena and other sweet items are also prepared that double the fun of revelers. Besides, sweet beetle witness a huge demand during this period as it has become a must have for everyone during Rajo. बहुत सारे तरह के पीठे मिलते हैं हमें जैसे कि चकुरी पीठा एंड मोंडा पीठा, पोड़ो पीठा, खीरा पीठा ऐसे बहुत सारे के मिलते हैं। Though the country still struggles with the taboos related to menstruation as it is perceived as something impure and embarrassing in our Indian society, this Rajo festival signifies how menstruation, fertility and womanhood are the cause of celebration and not shame in Indian culture. Odisha state observes state holiday on first day of the festival. With that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care. People have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect. Subscribe Tag TV YouTube channel and press the notification button.